The sport of off-road racing is full of incredible stories, wild characters, legends, and even villains. We cover it all on offroadracer.com, but there's only so much we can put down in an article. Sometimes we have to dig a little deeper, and that means sitting down with some of our industry's most influential characters and hitting record. Welcome to the Off-Road Racer Podcast, a Mad Media production, made exclusively for offroadracer.com. Each month, we'll go beyond the dirt into the homes, shops, and lives of the most interesting and game-changing icons of our sport. You'll hear about their history, success, failure, and everything in between as we pull back the curtain and reveal the stories of their lives. I'm your host, Matt Martelli, and this is the Off-Road Racer Podcast. I'm Matt Martelli. This is the Off-Road Racer Podcast, and I'm here with my good friend, Marty Fiolko. What's up, man? Oh, you know, not much. Yeah. It's uh, Wednesday before Crandon, and uh, we're here sitting here taking some time and in the big house here in, in our barn and just having a chance to sit and talk to you. I, I don't think I'd really take much time for anybody else, to be honest with you, <laughs> especially right now, if you know what's going on today or the last three months here. But uh, no, I'm glad to have you back. It's yeah, fun. well, you know me. I don't really take no for an answer, but, right. but I've, I'm also, being a promoter on your end, I also know that there's like, a, there's like these little s- periods right before the the mayhem and i thought we'd cut, kind of slide in here yeah no it's great and what a perfect setting this is the four, 54th 54th Grand? yep korean world championships yeah. yep yeah no super exciting and you know just to run down the run of show this is not just short course racing you've got the ultra four guys here you have class 11 guys utv racers who else um, am i missing oh kiss well, let's not and, about- and kiss yeah, yeah so yeah and it's not just uh just you know, gene simmons just that <laughs> yeah. that's a whole thing right. in that conversation but no we we were very fortunate a couple of years ago we decided we need to expand this week into a lifestyle event uh it was really good as you know you've been here yeah. before but then bringing ultra four here was good and then we we kind of built out the stadium back there and built a whole rock section for people to come. We weren't sure if the fans were going to like it. And we had the first year we had it was on a, on like a hill with a bunch of trees. And all of a sudden, it was Saturday night, and people went into the trees. And what's great about it is like Baja because there was lights on the vehicles. Yeah. They come to the back part of the forest, and we built this whole rock section, and the fans loved it. So we built out literally a kind of a rock racing stadium. So we have like the ultimate hybrid here. We've got rocks in back. We have the short course track, but there's rocks in front too. And the Saturday night deal under the lights here now was not just the 4,400 cars. It's all the Ultra 4 classes. So we went from about 72 entries last year to about 120 this year. Nice. So, yeah. So we have a record We have a record field, record crowd here this weekend. It's it's all record stuff. Well, plus Kiss. Yeah. Plus Kiss. Plus Kiss. Um, which is really cool because it, it really, what it does, it reconnects the West Coast culture of off-road racing with the Midwest culture of off-road racing, which I think is really important. Well, you know, that I, we can trace that back actually to uh, about six, seven, oh, excuse me, eight years ago now when we first had a conversation with the guys at Red Bull about needing a Super Bowl Sunday for short course. And that time, as you remember, Matt, the series were split. The yep. rules were split. Yeah. And everybody was up in arms that we would have the audacity to have our own race on Sunday. Like, <laughs> right. Like, and, well, how are you going to do that? Well... We basically came up with our own rules. Nothing much different than yeah. what IMSA does with a balance of performance. We added weight. We did some things to kind of hopefully get them close and say, hey, you guys need to come to Corandon. Just come for Labor Day Sunday. Yeah. And the West Coast guys came, and they'd for- either they hadn't been here before yeah. or they'd forgotten the magic of this place and how sure. big this event is. And all of a sudden, they're hooked on Labor Day Sunday in the Midwest. And then now... The fans here, which are so dedicated and loyal, have the best athletes. Yeah. They have all the Pro 2 guys, all the Pro 4 guys, you know, Bryce Menzies versus, you know, whoever it is going to be on, on, on our side the here. Greaves, the, right? the Greaves, yeah. yeah. The Greaves and, you know, all those. And it just really felt like the magic was back. But it took having all the athletes here to, to really call it a world championship again and have them here on this weekend, especially on this Sunday coming up. Which I think is really important because – Throughout the history of not just off-road racing, but racing in general, like sponsors, leagues, team owners, like there's always been this like interference and people pushing their agendas, which ultimately leads to the the division of the the sport and the culture. And it, there's nobody who doesn't want to come race for Crandon. You know what I mean? Like, I it, it's it's a place I want to come to every year as a fan, as a racer. I want to race. I want to come here and hang out and have a good time. Uh, for P 
people out there who haven't been here, um, this is like uh, it, it. People go, well, the indie of off road, but I don't think that's even describing it adequately because turn one at Crandon is probably the wildest thing in all of motorsports. It is, and I've had actually my friend Ralph Shaheen is going to be here has said that very thing. Uh, you know, and it, and I, but I actually hearken it back. I actually am a huge Indy 500 fan. I've been there all my life. Went to many, worked at many, and you learn so much for how to build America. Right? It's a it's American tradition. It's the end of summer, not the beginning of summer. But it's all this tradition of hey, it's Labor Day Sunday. We're gonna have a parade. We're gonna yep. we're gonna celebrate the laborer really here, and that's where the, a lot of the magic is. So it's mixing some of those elements of having a big grand opening, a big opening ceremonies. You know, some patriotism, some rock and roll, ACDC, whatever it's gonna be. And uh, yeah, it, it it's it's a cross culture. But you mentioned something that I think you can understand and appreciate as a promoter too. Is sometimes you know. You spend your life, when I was at Dirt Sports, being a little benign, being a little, you know, you're going to be Switzerland, you're going to be kind of friends to everybody. Well, sometimes you have to step in and have some direction sure. and say the sport needs this, and we're not going to worry about dictation from anybody. Like, there's nobody's going to tell us how this is going to work at Crandon, and nobody's yeah. going to tell us how it's going to work on Sunday, so we need to have Red Bull in, but yeah, Monster, you need to come in and shoot content too, and the rule is you can't change the name of the event. Right. You can't blur out content on either side. Right. That's how this works, but we don't, you know, we just don't, we, that's how we, we keep this here, and, and even here at the racetrack, the Ultra 4, you know, we call it Crandon Land now, that's actually a separate park set sure. from, on branding side than the, than the front park is. That's why we can have Amsoil here, but it's, we're in the Lucas Oil Barn. Yeah. Nobody in this sport has enough investment where they can really, really expect to have exclusivity. It, it doesn't work. They well, have to be all here. What I, I, lo I love this track because of a lot of reasons, but, you know, one of the main reasons is how it started, right? And this started as the brush run. Right. And then the Flannerys and a group of people here, uh, you know, built this and and they built it together. And it was, you know, it was a, basically a nonprofit that just kept perpetuating. And it's hilarious to me that in the world of motorsports that, you know, these, you know, what people would describe as rednecks from Wisconsin were able to build, you know, the most important short course race course in the world and really not just it's not just about short course it's a pillar of off-road culture yeah you know you you uh, you know in a relative time span of 54 years i'm still fairly new at this, this is my gonna be my ninth year but you you can't help but come in here and have some um awe about what was really built here and how it was built like sure. you know it's easy to come in in one sense and have lots of money and just say we're going to build this track but when you see like the entrance gate with the stone like we have here just for the day entrance sure. gate, it took them probably a month of Saturdays and Sundays volunteers just erecting that gate. There wasn't a big construction crews in here. No. And we just con it's constructed this brand new camping area for all the Ultra 4 USA racers that are here, a big one. That's 120 campsites because we're running out of room. And the difference is it wasn't crammed and saying, okay, let's get construction crews in here. It was Cliff Flannery. Yeah. I saw him every day in the summer here. Where yeah. literally he's in the machine every day at 5 through in the morning moving dirt, yeah. moving trees, making that happen. And, and that's where you have this awe of these, the work ethic that happens in this place. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's unparalleled. Well, it's like, it's, like, it's like the church of blue-collar motorsports, right? It is. You know, and that, that's why I dig it because it's the celebration of that. It wasn't founded by, like, huge corporation or – there wasn't this like, you know, crazy business plan for like, here's how we're going to make a bunch of money, like a dot com company or whatever. Right. There weren't stockholders or any of that. It was like, you know, a small group of people working their asses off and building this. And like now it's easy to look at it and be, oh, yeah, of course, this is obvious. But like, you know, t 30 years ago, people were probably standing around going, what are you doing? Why are you wasting your time and money and you know, torturing us with all of this. And really, for short course racing, this is the center of the universe. And those people, those blue-collar people built it, as well as the fans. Like, the other part that I love about Crandon is the fans. You know, not just the amount of fans, but who they are. Uh, being a kid that was born in Michigan, I look out and I'm like, these are my, uh, you know, <laughs> they look like my family members, right? So, um, yeah, it's really cool. 
It is, and you see, you see them coming in today, right? The only difference is when I first started coming here is it used to be that our fans came with tents. Yeah. And I say, you know, uh, old school buses with stripper poles, right? That's yes, what they used I to be. That. They yes. were. Yeah. And, and, and that was part of it. But now they're coming in fifth wheels. But the beauty of that and that type of thing is that they're bringing families. Yeah. And, they're, and now the weekend starts Wednesday, like today. Like yeah. We are backed up on the highway forever, and it ends Monday. Yeah. We have five days of coming, hanging out. And that's the thing that the West Coast missed. On the short course side. Totally. That they, 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 they'd forgotten. And they had the, the example. The example yeah. is right here. But well, the fact in, is, in Riverside back in the day, Riverside too. did have it. I'm yeah. talking more, more recently yeah, on the more short recently, course side. Yeah. You've forgotten that, no, you're asking people to come for two days. They don't want to, people don't do that. Yeah. But if you make it a camping-friendly environment that, that, like I said, in the Midwest, everybody's got a side-by-sides. Everybody has fifth wheels. Everybody. Yep. So, so you make it, you, you work towards that, and now you give them racing like us now we've got all day saturday right which is all champ off road racing but then saturday night on the lights it's all rock racing yeah you had I mean, a 29 class 11s from the west coast there was that's 15 so more rad. something than there was last year they're building him here now right um you know, you know sometimes you have to be crane i always say is like the locomotive it's pu- it's pulling this whole sport with it well and you think about all the things recently that short course has gone through i i really think that if crandon wasn't here as the you know pillar that it is that that we not we might not be short course racing yeah i i, I suspect that's probably true i mean it's, it's easy to sit here and say that because of the success crandon's had but the one thing is that that, that the Flannerys and Cliff Flannery particularly, he never, ever, ever was afraid to invest. Yeah. Invest in his dream, invest in building this place. He's still about building bigger, yeah, more, still, more, I, more, so more, more. I pulled up. He was on the tractor. I'm like waving at yeah. him. He's, he's going, who's that? Yeah. So, so, but he also invests in, in people, invests in, 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 in even in me, in having an opportunity to work a long most of my time is spent on Crandon. Yeah. Well, but that's the that's the secret sauce of having a promoter who can invest the time it takes, and you know yeah. how much it takes just to forget it's year to, round. to get one sponsor. Yeah. And then to to now have three or four year contracts that's taken six years, five yeah. years, seven years, and kind of Red Bulls our eighth year with Red Bull. Yeah. And that Red Bull signs with no one, but they love this event, and yeah. so um, that's but but it but nobody is aware unless you're in it how much work that really takes. So Mitch, why is this bike so drippy? It's our 23 race bike. We can start up front, work our way to the back. Bones can tell you about the suspension. The rear shock is one of the most critical parts of the bike. Pegs with the titanium mounts. Kashima coating here. And a gravity lightweight battery. Young's modulus. Horse and a half. Works Works chassis lab. More tie than a space shuttle. Really? I might need that repeated. This thing slaps. Slaps. Oh, you should have told me that earlier. Well, speaking of that, let's talk about you a little bit, because I think that, you know, and I'm just, you know, kind of paraphrasing, but like a lot of people know your name and, but there was the era that you were working for dirt sports where you were, you were very visible. And I think people knew more people knew you at that point. So let's talk a little bit about your history. I mean, you started in racing and then came over to off-road racing, right? Yeah, I mean, I was always interested. I was interested in Volkswagens. My dad was German, and we had Volkswagens, and I was working on Volkswagens and going to race sports car races, cam races, enamored with Porsches, always Porsches. And then, yeah, I, I built some street bugs, but it was always about off-road racing. And it's funny this weekend. It's a funny feedback because it, I started in, at Bosch, and then became the Bosch off-road racing manager in 1988. I was 25. 26 years old, I kind of, me and a guy named Bob Mount built the first off-road super team in the desert with Yokohama, Bosch, and Toyota. We had five cars in that at that time. We had a class one, a class two, which was unlimited two-seater, class 10, and two stock 7S trucks. And uh, we were the first kind of super team that debuted at the Parker race in 1989. Right. Well, Yokohama found a picture of me Next to Bob Mount, I had like full, like full blonde mustache, blonde center part <laughs> hair, short shorts. Right. But behind us were the, was the livery of the of these Yokohama yeah. cars. Well, they found out found out about this, saw the picture, and they actually now came to this Cranor race with I think eight or nine cars that are all in that same livery. Oh, how it's cool. a whole throwback thing. How so cool. that's that's all part of how this came about. Yeah, I was just fortunate enough to, you know, I tried the corporate thing. 
wasn't very good corporately. Yeah. I don't think, I think we're on a higher boat. I think you are too. I don't think yeah, we're, we're terrible. We're, yeah, I can't be. <laughs> you so, you want to upset people in a corporation? Bring me in. <laughs> yeah, bring me in and have me say, what are we spending five yeah. hours in this one email for? We got exactly. work to do, right? The daisies so, are going to be yeah. stepped on. <laughs> so, you know, no, but I was, well, I did all that. I mean, I went, worked with some PR agencies, did some things, but really, you know, worked it with Nissan Motorsports, went to the Indy 500, went to La Mans three times, worked, saw motorsports from a different perspective. Like, sure. I, I motorsports as a whole, as a, as a how, how, and you just learn, absorb how these things work. And, uh, you know, but yeah, I, I, the, the dirt sports thing was great because I had written the book on, 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 and then obviously I did the first, the real dust of glory. I'm just going to call it that. And now, uh, you know, well, let's, but hold on. Let, oh, let's sorry. explain the book, right? Because the book was a pretty major milestone in, in the, in the history of, of off-road racing because there's not a lot of books, right? No. And A Thousand Miles of Glory comes out and it really, you know, I don't know if that's what led everybody to make Dust of Glory, but it, it, to me, when when I look at the book, I'm like, oh, it's the explanation of Dust of Glory of like how cool the Baja 1000 is, i.e. our off-road culture. Yeah, I mean, again, going back to the same thing. So when it was in Indianapolis in the late 90s, what Indy does best is take its history, suck it all in, exploit every part of it yeah and they and and you make you feel like i make like you step Special. into indianapolis motor speed yeah. it's history first it's not yeah. how big it is it's like yeah. man i can smell the history here yeah. i can see it so for me it's like so we've got we've got these amazing off-road culture that nobody had ever talked about nobody had really yeah. looked at it so in 2000 for score sal i did an event at the peterson automotive museum and brought those cars together in a celebration of Baja 2000. Right. And that led to, I need to do a book, which was a five-year project. Was none of the history, none of those those things. And it, all, it took a, two years to do the, the back part of the book, which was all the history. Right. Who won? What class? So that I could write the front. But it, yeah, that did lead to, 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 thousand, to, the, to the movie, to, to Dust of Glory. And uh, like I said, it, 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 those two cultural pinnings are still... Like that's something that Interesting I uh, that's something that I think you should be really proud of and that people should understand because you know I look at you know coming from action sports culture we had a lot of be we had a lot of media right we had multiple media groups that were celebrating the culture through magazines through uh you know through films you know there every day there was you know content that was skate surf snow related right so there was a machine of a group of people doing all this stuff and that didn't really exist in in off road. It did in little pieces, you know. For a while, uh, when Sal and 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 you know they had the Score magazine and they had the trade shows and and that type of stuff, but but overtly overall, it didn't exist. And so to to have that be published, I think is a very important thing because it really distills down our culture into something that you can hand to somebody and go here, you know, read this, look at this. And then come to a race because it's difficult to get people to races. It is, it is, and and, and it, it actually was that way too with Dust of Glory. I mean, it's interesting. One of my now friends who raced with us at Nora a couple of years ago uh, is here, and he's he's one of the main product people at, the, at Polaris. Right. So they came here and did a, a, a pre-launch for one of their vehicles, and we sat and had dinner. And here's this young guy, very very outspoken, very outgoing, and. He said, you know, he goes, so you know about this off-road stuff? I said, yeah, I, I know about it. He said, so, man, so when I was young, there was this movie, and <laughs> it just made me like crazy to think about racing in Baja. He goes, he goes it was called Dust of Glory. You know anything about it? Yeah. I said, yeah, yeah, I know about it. And he found out that I was one of the producers, and he was like floored. Yeah. But, but what was amazing, the story that goes back to Dust of Glory was when we were sitting around a table, it was, it was Mouse McCoy and I and Scott Waugh. I don't think Dana was there. Anyway, we discussed what what are we doing sure. this for, and the conversation immediately focused on we need to make our endless sunny, uh, endless Sunday or on on any sun on any endless summer. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Anyway, but those could be interchanged. Yeah, right? but, that could be the next movie. Yeah, <laughs> but it was intended to be our endless summer or right. on any Sunday, meaning that this thing has evergreen storytelling. Yes, that's super rich. That, that will transcend us. Yeah. So if you watch Endless Summer now, you're immediately a surf culture person. Sure. And so what's amazing is I talked to Scott a while back, and I said, you know what we need to do is we need to do a 20th anniversary, a reunion, a screening, because it's going to be 20 years old in wow. 2025. And we decided we needed to do that because we felt that, you know what, I watched it with my wife a couple months ago, and we sat there 
in our room, shut the lights, and basically shut the lights. Let's yeah. watch this movie. And I was taken aback, not because I had forgotten parts, but it was really emotional to see some of the, the touchstones of giving back to Mexico, the soundtrack, the Mario story, yep. you know, the things that are so good, the Johnny Campbell handing the, the kid the jersey, you know? Yeah. Man, that stuff still gets and, me. And he's first year in class one. That, the Malcolm Smith's orphanage, all yeah. the things that we, class 11, all the things that we touched upon yeah. that year, uh, you know, and then there was an opportunity to make the second one, and I turned it down because I felt like the genie was out of the bottle. Like, right. it was just, we had given it all then, and I felt like, um, you know, when I watched, when I watched back my wife, it kind of shut it off and said, man, that's still a great movie. It it's is. Still, on its own. Well, and, and again, I can't stress the importance of it because... What we learned in, in skateboarding is that every time we put together a skate film, we sold product and it expanded the culture, right? And it became a tool to share with people about what our culture was about. And one thing that you've always been really good at is storytelling, right? And what I thought was impressive about Dust of Glory is that it, it, it wasn't one story, right? And that's what our culture is, is, is it's not one story. It's your story. It's the next person's story. It's the next person's story. It's thousands of stories, every race. Right. And so then how do you, how do you communicate that to people? And I thought that that film did a really good job of saying, look, we got the top guys, right. And then we got the nobodies, right. And then we have a bunch of people in between and they're all having these completely unique experiences, but also like, like you said, the tenements of our culture of, of being good stewards and giving back to, to you know, the people of Baja and, and the different things like that. Yeah, but it also did it in a way that was, remember, this is before drones. This yeah. is before GoPros. Yes. In a sense, I, I may be wrong on no, that. No, you're right. But, but the point was, you know, going down there to a real Baja Thousand race, which, as you know, has a very short window of daylight. Sure. And you're bringing 75 cameras. Now, yeah. granted, we did... Uh, b-roll pickup afterwards and stuff but cinematically how it looked and even especially how it sounded the soundtrack was really good i yeah. mean it was just epic and you know that the helicopter shots going down and sent out all the yeah. you know the chase all of that still resonates to me and but you're right the storytelling I mean, even here yeah you know so now we're at 400 and i think 20 race teams in crandon right so now the tough tar part is picking out what stories are going to help tell through our production stuff that we're doing here. And that's, you know, that's, that's always a bit of a challenge. But I think it's a good problem because you, you never, I, you know, it's funny because I've been watching a lot of uh, uh, sports documentaries late, lately and uh, the NFL and the NBA and they've all figured out like they should be doing this, but a lot of them suck. I mean, straight up, they do. they're, they're boring, you know, they're boring stories or, you know, they're just not, they're they're just pulling punches, right? And they're not getting into the real grittiness of of the story uh, of what it really is. So it, I think that that's the luxury that we have is that you know it's going to change. And, you know, in, next race there'll be a new guy, right? You know, um, there'll be something different happening. There'll be different drama. The, you know, the track conditions, the people. Uh, sponsor changes, technology evolutions, you know, like uh, all kinds of things. All that lives here, you know, in short course, uh, quite a bit. Uh, yeah. Viscerally, dynamically watching these trucks, especially Pro uh, 2 and Pro 4, it, there's nothing no. better, actually, in motorsports no. ever. No. And I've got some uh, friends coming this weekend who've never been here before. Yeah. So Sal this Fish is coming here this weekend, hasn't yeah. been. Uh, Wilfred Eibach. He, he's never been here? No. Wilfred Eibach, I mean, from Germany, never been here. Oh, wow. Scott Atherton, who was the president of IMSA, yeah. is going to be here. Paul Fanner, nice. never been here, is coming here. These are people who live in the motorsports realm but never been here. Yeah. I, I can't wait to take them to the infield to watch the real trucks or to the back. Yeah. But interesting, on the storytelling side, you're right. There's a lot of content that's not very good right now in terms of that because they're trying to weed stories in. But one of the best things I saw, because it's – it's you're right. There's technology and all the the the, the really loud visceral stuff. But then there was a, 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 a documentary done at the end of his life on John Madden. And the most interesting thing was what what they did was they they put him on a set and they put tables or, or like chairs around it. And there was a big screen. And all John Madden was doing is watching himself at the end of his life and when he was younger. Hmm. And the shot from behind of his face with his head. 
you know, you can just picture what that looks like, the silhouette of his, of his dark head with this beautiful screen in front of him, you know, when he was younger, when, they, when he won the Super Bowl with the Oakland Raiders, then, and what that felt, and then he's shooting back at his face. You know, the, the one thing I, I, I regret in life almost more, I didn't get a nut, my second film done, which is called The Baja Social Club, but I had put together uh, a clip from the 1968 Baja 1000. I bought the archives from, from Bruce Brown, the outtakes right. of the 1968 right. Baja 1000, Mexican 1000. And one of those came from a picture in my book of Bruce Myers, from Myers Manx, being interviewed by Jim McKay of Wide yeah. World Sports, but it didn't make the cut on Bruce's thing. But I found the interview, right. and then I found the, the soundtrack. They were separate because they were film canisters. And I synced them. James Masters, I was working, synced them up. And I always thought, how cool would it be to do the same thing with Bruce, oh, and sit yeah. there and watch his own interview when he was, this was, you know, whatever it was, you know, 50 years later that he yeah. probably forgot he even did. Totally. You know, it would have been just a great I shot. I just beautiful. never did it, but, but, but Madden did do it that way, and yeah. I thought it was really a good way of doing it. Well, there's, there's, you know, we have some time. We can, there's some more stuff we can do, but. All right, Chase, number 23, it's 2023. This championship's yours. Let's show these guys what's up. Easy, boys. It's not over yet. Big dog still got to eat. <laughs> Whatever you say, big dog. Seriously? These fools think I'm fried? They know the deal. Let, you know, back to talking about you for a minute. So, you know, dust to glory. But then, you know, Dirt Sports Magazine, you know, it's funny because I laugh, you know, and I don't call you every single time this comes up, but, like, people have these references now where they're like, oh, yeah, you're doing, like, you know, like we do for offroadracer.com, we'll do a, a vehicle feature, and the guys will look at me and go, oh, like a masterpiece in metal? And I'm like, yes, exactly. So to talk about, I mean, Dirt Sports was – a really rad publication because to my knowledge in, in this probably in the last couple decades, it was the only magazine that really wrapped its hand around our culture and, and told the whole story rather than it just being like some of these traditional magazines that are like, you know, oh, they're trying to lump everything together to sell you a set of wheels. Yeah, no. And, and I, I fought that battle all the time because for me it started and ended with the fact that I was an off-road racer first. Yeah. Like, I, I'm proud of being the off-road motorsports Hall of Fame, but in my acceptance speech, I sat there, and one of the people at my table is Bob Gordon, who was my hero. Right. And I wanted to be in because I was Bob Gordon, not because I was Marty Fioca. Sure. I wanted to be a, the, the best off-road driver, especially in an open-wheel buggy, than there ever was, and that was Bob to me. And uh, But, you know, I, Dirt Sports um, was great because we built cars and we understood the technology and we could write about you know stuff that nobody talked about like how do you how do you you know do internal bypass shocks that you know we had Tommy Morris did a yep. whole series and I'm talking about a series I'm talking about like okay Tommy go at it and we nicknamed the professor as a 14 part series sure. on how to valve shocks well nobody does that or how does this gearbox work or or the history stuff we did or some of the personality stuff and some of was kind of cutting edge stuff we did and never having a not ever failing to have an opinion on stuff because again you got to have opinion and sure. you know when we posted stuff that I would write on a, an opinion piece that those that's what actually drove viewership or, or readership but the masterpiece in metal that was a pure takeoff on Paul Fanner and Racer yeah because my friend still my one of my best friend Boyd James worked for Jeff Swart yeah when Fent, he was, unbelievable photographer unbelievable Boyd. but it was like Boyd okay. Because we shot for a racer, I saw Robbie Gordon's race truck. Yeah. And then when I raced the Groff Class 1 car, the yellow BFG Toyota, which was in Dust of Glory. Yes. It was out in Racer, and it was out on, in the Long Beach Grand Prix, and the car was in the Toyota booth, and they saw the race. The, the, I remember the Japanese engineers looking at the car and looking at Racer like, oh, my God, it's, it's in Racer magazine. It was a Class 1 car. We yeah. had no business doing that, but we did. But, it was, but that was where we could really show. And the sad part about that whole deal is that it would still live if Dirt Sport had went to a coffee table quarterly. Well, we could really show the photography. Totally. Yeah, you know, like marginal crappy paper. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, yeah. When you look at the images on a computer screen that Boyd shot, they're beautiful. Yeah. They're beautiful, and they just don't translate on the ink and paper that we had. Yeah. But it was still, it didn't matter. It, that masterpiece in metal showed 
also so much of the craftsmanship that went on, went, goes into all those vehicles and um, just the beautiful lighting he did. I mean, it was done differently than anybody still does it. If you watch Boy do it, yeah. it wasn't a, a, a soffit box on top. He was actually individually lighting and gelling and doing all these touches that you really have to understand what he was doing. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not, <laughs> I'm the I'm the probably the most difficult person to impress when it comes to visual imagery because we do it day in, day out, right? So I can see when people are being lazy, you know, and, and, you know, making shortcuts. And that was one of the things where I sought Boyd out to become friends with him and became friends with him because I, of what I saw him do. Yeah. You know, Vince Knackle, who is our director of photography, like he's the same way when somebody's good, he'll, he'll be like, yeah, Boyd's good, you know? And so, <clears throat> you know, that was such a great era of, of, of media and I think it's really something that's necessary that we need to bring back in some sort of format because it, it really gave credit to a lot of the people who don't or who previously didn't get credit because it was easy to look at the drivers and be like, oh, these people are the heroes, right? Of course. But then when you start understanding like there's geniuses in the shop behind them who are working thousands of man hours to make these really works of art that you're going to go out and destroy. Right. And then you're going to rebuild them after every race. Like, like the, the concept of it is pretty psychotic, right? It is, but, but it also took a mentality away from, and I'm just going to kind of be honest here, it took a mentality away from being kind of the standard kind of shop four by four Jeep guy. Yeah. Like, no, 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 no. We're going to go, we're going to compare these to Indy cars. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to talk about the plumbing and the fittings and the stuff that same Indy cars, it didn't matter if it was a MoTeC dash. Yeah. It was all the, like, you know, six speed sequential gearboxes, the real stuff that like these other race people look at like, oh my God. Even if you look at Johnny Greaves, you know, pro four. Yeah. It's super it's high tech. Clock. But, you know, you just, you wouldn't know it because nobody talks about it. Right. And so we, we took the opposite approach well, of that. It's fun. It's funny. It's one thing that bothers me to this day is when, when somebody, you know, builds a car, right? It doesn't really matter what type of car, but they put all this effort in and then you see one social media fo fo photo of it on a trailer and you're like, hey, new car. And I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. You know what I mean? Especially yeah. the, you know, when you get into the trophy trucks and all that kind of stuff, it's like, you know. Lamborghini isn't going like, hey, no big deal. We have a new Lambo. They're making a big deal about it. And guess what? That Lambo probably has less man hours into it than a trophy oh, truck. I guarantee it does. So, so it's, it's context and it's explaining the value of what the, the, you know, the, what the vehicles are, you know? Yeah, and you know, it, it, some of it, it's also, um, you know, again, it, it goes back to this place a little bit. I mean, yes, we are super proud of having the heritage we have like with the sportsman classes. Sure. Super proud of all of the things we've done here. But then the mistake sometimes is lumping that in like, oh, we got all these races. Like we have 54 or five races in three days here. Right. But we try to emphasize the fact that, you know, now the Pro 2s and Pro 4s are coming. Now the, you know, the, the 4,400 cars are coming. Sure. Because, you know... That's still the, the epitome. You have to have an opinion. They can't all be the same. No, and, no, and even you know, doing something like we've never done this year. You know, we wanted something that was going to lead in to Friday night. And the way the schedule works here, you know, Friday night has been, been kind of reserved for some sportsman racing, which is fine. It's great, yeah. but it's like no, 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 no. So we're going to do a pro two or a pro light versus a pro buggy cup race Friday oh, night. Oh, sick. No, only, I mean, yes, Lucas did it on, on the bull rings yeah. and like Elstar. We never did it here. But it's like I've got that'll be interesting. I have. Potentially fifteen, eighteen thousand people coming for Kiss. You know, literally a couple hundred yards behind us here. Right. And if five thousand come early, two thousand come early because they can come and watch the racing for free yeah. with their concert ticket. That's a win. I have to have something better. Yeah. I have to have something faster, something more visceral. We can't run the twos and fours because the way the the schedule works with how they work. Right. But I can do this race, and I can run the class elevens last, which we are. Nice. Just because people remember that i uh, I, I, I can explain it because i'm a volkswagen guy but well, i remember yeah. the first time i told but, cliff flannery i said cliff we're gonna bring volkswagen he goes what you're gonna bring some stock volkswagen so i said trust me just watch the kids and he, so he got it in context of that this is hilarious because um you know i'm friends with pastrana and all the nitro guys and i love what they're doing but it was funny because when they started integrating class 11s i'm like you guys you're gonna get this the show's gonna get stolen 
you know, and I and we were at a <clears throat> at L store, and they're like, "Ah, oh, what do you mean, Matt?" And I'm like, "Trust me, you know." And now it was like, uh, you know, I talked to them the other day, and they're like, "Yeah, the class eleven content is getting more views and more more uh, responses." than the rally cars are. Yeah. And it's yep. just it's just something where like I think people really love VW bugs. They relate to them. And then I think my generation and back all had to drive one, right? Yeah. It was the it was my first car. I literally show a picture uh when I'm doing, you know, uh different uh speaking at the colleges. I the first photo I show is like here here I am uh, my dad's push starting my VW bug and I'm in it going to college. Right. And that was it. I was broke. Right. But that car got me through the first two years of college. And then we turned into a race car and yes. destroyed it. So I built <laughs> yeah. my first Volkswagen bug was a Baja bug when I yeah. was 14, lived in Northern California. And for, for whatever reason, I don't know if it was alignment with the starter or in the, in the transmission, the damn thing would hardly ever start. So I remember always having to park it on a hill so like a compression start, yeah. or, or literally, if it, if something happened, I have to literally push start it. Yeah. Like I push start that thing all over the place. It was ridiculous. It was, yeah. But but that's what. Look, I, I ended up, you know, like I said, I'm still racing. I mean, you know, my Nora team still has one Volkswagen powered yeah. car, and I have a Type Four Porsche in another one. But once you get into that air cooled thing, that's kind of where you're at. It's it's rad. I, I just you know, and it's really cool to see the revival of it. Um, we're going to have Class 11s racing with us indefinitely at, at our races. So uh, I, I think it's really cool. I was actually talking to Wilkie, and Wilkie's like, come on, man, I'll build you one. And I'm like, oh, man, here we go. Yeah, I had, I had, a, <laughs> I had an offer to drive one again this weekend. I'm like, you know, I'd, I'd love to, but but I have a friend of mine, Cameron Terry, who's here. He, he, yeah, I he, saw that. He, he, rented, he rented one, so there'll be a lucky sperm driving around here. In case you don't know Cameron, that's kind of his nickname. But, you know, yeah. he's, I've, I've known him for 40 years. We raced together up yeah. in Northern California. He's an OG off-road racer. He is OG, so he's here. And But like I said, having 29 of them. But, again, he goes back to the same thing. You know, it's a little bit different here. Uh, in terms of being a promoter, because you have to sometimes remember the fans. Sure. Like you, it, yes, we get caught up in live stream, you caught up in television, all the production stuff. I mean, look, we've got 39 hours of live streaming out of here right. over the weekend, including a preview show from the parade, all the things that are happening with Speed Sport here with, with, in terms of the shows between the races, um, you know, running Red Bull Cup Sunday, then the network after that. So you, but you, and that's all like a big priority. Like, what story are we going to tell? Like, I, I don't know if I may have said that. You know, we were able to get Casey Mears here for the first time. Yeah. So, and it's the Father Rogers coming. Rogers, Which is ne awesome. Rogers never been here either. Oh, really? No. That's so, crazy. Yeah, I was but... hoping to get Rick here because Rick was my hero growing yeah. up too. But the but Mears gang, the Mears gang is coming back to Grand. That's cool. It's super cool. Yeah. I mean, but um, yeah. So, but but it's just again, it's it, you have to remember. That all that's great, but it's still the people who are in the 100%. seats buying hot dogs, you know, buying cold beers, buying cheese curds that you know, eventually allow us to actually keep building and keep paying for the live stream. You know, that stuff's expensive, bringing, the, expensive. bringing in the Ken Stouts and Ralph Sheens, but we're also elevating that to trying to get as close to network as we can on the live stream, and we're pretty close. Yeah. Uh, I think some of the, obviously, the drone stuff has helped. Uh, you know, we, we've perfected some of that stuff now. It's two drones. Now it's, you know, trying to show establishing shots. And yeah. And that's a, that's a game changer, especially here because the, the challenge here with aerial coverage is the acceleration rate of the pro twos and pro fours. Like you can't cover that with a helicopter. No. Like you can hover over the whole right. track and do those types of shots, but it doesn't translate uh, like an FPV drone does, like. right? It doesn't, and and the thing we are doing here, though, to, to, to give it context, so on the pro the cup race on Sunday afternoon, which is our pro two versus pro four race, yep. we're going to run a high drone just so at the start, so they can see the split because you can't really understand the splits. Like, sure. okay, oh wait, oh I see now the pro twos are starting this far ahead of the pro right. fours, and when he, when the pro fours start, we can cut to that so we can kind of give it the context of how much difference because a one point seven five mile track, you can't do a cup race. With those two vehicles, with those two classes, anywhere except you have a long, the long track here. Which, sure. So we have three different track configurations here now, and most of it's illuminated. So if you have to run at night, we can too. Nice. That's yeah. great. Yeah, we've been working on that. Night racing is awesome. We haven't figured out how to quite do it here yet, but we will. Yeah. No, that's great. Racing against your dad is something that ninety percent of the racers in the world will never get. I've accomplished everything I wanted to do, and now he's just like taking the reins. I want to be remembered for being a, a, a huge part of short course, not just racing, keeping it alive, helping it grow, 
if it comes down to the last weekend and I'm in it, the boys better watch out. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just running down your accolades here, right? So, you know, 1,000 Miles to Glory, you know, uh, Dust to Glory, then Dirt Sports, which was how many years? About, for, my, for me, I think it was eight. Yeah, so it, almost a decade, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, you know, and then, uh, I mean, just tons and tons of, you know, involved in marketing projects, involved with, you know, Nora, you know? Yeah, we helped Nora out in the beginning. I, I was solidly behind that concept because it, it allowed somebody like me who still loved off-road racing, obviously, as you know, I still love racing, desert racing. I still love driving my open-wheel air-cooled cars more than anything. Sure. Uh, and uh, it allowed me to kind of go back and, and, and tackle the Baja in a way I wanted to do it. With I vintage cars. Vintage cars, right. one thing, but it was the format. Yeah. So now I don't have to pre-run. I yep. can run pump gas, uh, and my guys can come with me, have a great time. We race for six or seven hours, and we're done. And then we can hang out in the pits and have fun. For how many days? For five. Right. Right. And we, and my wife, can, Susan, can fly to Cabo San Lucas. who can meet me at the yeah. finish line. And that format, especially when you don't have the money to really do a Baja 1000 correctly, which we just... Yeah. Did, we did, I did I raised 15 Baja thousands I didn't want to do anymore I didn't want the, the stuff like my guys on the road with the trucks you know all the things that you know are, are dangerous out there I was more worried in the race car about my guys sure. than I was about me I mean safer in the race car right um, and it just be, it, even the, the logistics just became a nightmare where, where Nora was but but it was the vintage thing too and it allowed again guys a whole generation of guys like me my age who were able to come back and go race Baja I've done every Nora race since well it what what I loved about it um, was it really galvanized the idea of vintage vehicle racing, right? Of vintage off-road racing. And the fact that, you know, there were a lot of these cars that were sitting gathering dust. And, you know, I think one of the challenges is that other, we, we're influenced by other motorsports and some other motorsports run vintage cars. Some of them keep them and they're trailer queens, right? But because of what you guys did with Nora, it became the norm rather than the, you know, uh, something unusual to run vintage cars. But go back, go back to motorsports history. Like in, in, in the end of next month in September, I'm, I'm leaving here next week, going right. back home, but I'm going, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to Monterey yeah. for the Rensport reunion. Why? Because it's the biggest Porsche motorsports event in the world. It's only every four years. But if you want to watch branding and history and culture come alive on cars that are 15 to 20 million dollars yeah it's because they were vintage car racing when before there was vintage ra racing right those cars sat in the side they sat in the, in the dust sure and so what i what i'd like loved seeing was our even we found our original single seater we still have nice. it we found it you know we, we found it we sold it and found it you know on a craigslist ad and uh you know we have two other ones but it but but it's the it, it's yeah it's it's not sure they're, they're faster cars sure but but it's not as cool. No. And for me, it, it's always you know I've driven almost everything, but it's but something about those cars. But it's but it's just again the, it, it's also a value that those cars now have value. Yeah. Right before you, I should have bought the cars I really wanted <laughs> I years ago. I, I didn't. Right. I, I I did buy a vintage short course car though. Did you? Yeah, because I just we're gonna go short course vintage racing here next June. Oh nice. And there was a, a car that won like four world championships here uh, at 1993 Barry and Laser that was driven by Art Schmidt, who was okay. a factory Nissan guy. And uh, yeah, it was for sale and it had a rabbit motor and running. And I just thought I was gonna buy it. And That's so cool. I, I last year I. The guy raced it here. I said, if it's the same condition, I'm going to buy it. Oh, so I, but then I bought it Sunday night, and then Monday I was I actually did laps around. I was like, wow. this is pretty damn fun. Yeah, that's, it's that's fun. Well, I know, I know. There's the 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 fastest. I guess you call the vintage car, but it was the it was the Pro Two that Di Frank built for Rob McCaffrey yeah. with air shocks yep. that, that was so good it got outlawed after yep. I think a year. It was. Yeah, that that happened too. But. But yeah, again, so the idea of having a place for those guys to race, right? Yeah. Just, just, and yeah, we, we we can't really fit it properly into our our race here in the fall. Sure. But we what we are going to do now. So one of the reasons we're we're doing the Kiss concert, we've had a thirty year relationship with the Potawatomi community here. Right. It's an Indian community here, and they're they're based right here in Crandon. Yep. And they've been involved for thirty years with the racetrack. And then this year they had a new CEO go down down at so they have a casino in Milwaukee. Yeah. So the CEO named Dominic uh, Ortiz came and said, you know, I have a new deal that I'm putting out with Kiss. And he came up and saw Cran and there's a casino here in Carter. He said, I wanna, I'd like to bring Kiss here, 
can you guys pull that off? And the conversation was, well, we did Kid Rock in 30 days. Uh, we can't do it, but our concert producer, Eric Jensen, can. Yeah. And so as long it was, and it was, it's essentially a separate event within the event. Yeah. So their production with Kiss, their everything, it's a separate deal. We provide basically parking concessions and, and alcohol, yeah. which is what we can kind of handle. We can't handle the, the setup. It's a very expensive show. It's yeah. much more expensive than Kid Rock was. But the, the point of that was trying to bring people here. So the hope is that in June of next year, Brush Runs will actually be a con- two-night country festival oh, cool. built around the race. Yeah. This is a concert. This is a race with a concert in it. Yeah. That's going to be a concert with racing. It's, it's a different way of looking at it. That's so cool. we think we can fill the park twice. And you know, honestly, again, looking at racing, racetracks only have one big event. If I could get close to an event and a half, like I said, even in June, we have 17,000, 18,000 people here. We'll have 65 sure. here this weekend over the three days. But um, if we can pull that off, then you know, I feel we've done something because we really can't open the park for much. It's so big yeah. that you, you, you know, putting 5,000 people in this place doesn't do anything. You need yeah. people. Yeah. So, that, so that's the hope for next year. That's cool. Yeah. Well, there's, I think it's like the top four uh, biggest songs in the country are, are country songs. Yeah, when you, when you come, I mean, that was the concern. So when, when we did the 50th, the, 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 the conversation was, well, who should we get? Yeah. And we all pretty much, we, we saw who was available, and Kid Rock was the hybrid. That's a no-brainer. No-brainer, right? Yeah. He's rock, he's country, he's, he's just American. He's just, yeah, and Ted Nugent wasn't available. So. Well, <laughs> I, I don't think Ted would have sold as well as Kid Rock did. No, like. probably not now. Not now. Yeah. So, um, you know, and the Kiss thing, uh, like I said, we're, we're getting, now we're getting a lot of walk-up. We know it's going to be a, a, a good show. We were concerned a couple weeks ago, but it's gotten much better. And, you know, if we can do classic rock every Labor Day here, um, but it, I think it has to be really kind of, really classic rock like if i can get an acdc here or i can even get a journey here it's going to be good yeah um you know we have to be super careful because again the production costs and it's a one night thing to bring in i mean the stage so the concert here is not a stripped down kiss concert this no. is a tour date yeah on their last this is the only wisconsin date they have on their whole tour right and their tour ends and their whole i think the last tour date they're ever going to do is going to be in december at madison square garden yeah they're kicking it all off in cran in wisconsin <laughs> Well, they're a Midwest band. I know that, but who would have thought? I yeah. mean, who, who would have thought that they'd be here? And this is literally their stadium stage, their pyro. This is not a stripped-down acoustic set. This is Kiss <laughs> in a stadium stage. That'll be awesome. Yeah, it'll I'm be looking good. forward to it. I mean, honestly, it was as a kid growing up in Michigan, and it's a funny story because it was the first major stadium concert that I went to as a kid, and it was Kiss and Prince. <laughs> yeah yeah imagine right? that yeah yeah and uh it was it was you know i mean i was already a, a fan before that i had all their albums and uh you know growing up and and the content that they um that they were involved in the tv shows and you know all the imagery it was really powerful but just think about that for a minute think about the fact we're sitting here in a place that's this old and it's dynamic and growing. Sure. It, it, you know, it's not stagnant. But think about the fact we've got all these race teams from all across the country. We've got some guys from Baja, some racers in Class 11. And here we are with this five-day off-road festival, essentially. And we have KISS here, too. We never thought that was going to happen a couple of years. I mean, I never thought. I, I had aspirations when I came here in terms of what it could be. But it was more about the racing side, about, sure. about the athletes, about really building. Because Short Course never had a Super Bowl Sunday. Well, I think. And I think- that's what we Built. But I also think that 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 speaks to you, right? Because yeah. and I know you're like you're not trying to take credit for everything, obviously. But you know when you look at your your history and your accolades and the things that you've done for this culture, you know this is another thing that you've done for this culture. Because listen, I, I know what the money's like, and it ain't that great, no. right? I mean, it's it's fine, you know. The, but you know, like we were talking about earlier, it's like you have a you have a trailer over there. And you're you're living and breathing this twenty four seven for the entire summer. It, I do. Right? It, it, so it, it's we, not like you're like, hey, I'm in California smoking weed at the beach, <laughs> you know, and I fly in, clap my hands, and everything's done. So, I, I think that's one of the things I respect and I re- appreciate about you is that you really love this culture and you really care about it, and you put your all into making these things better, and. You know, it, it was funny because I remember having this conversation with you as you were first getting involved here. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Like, when I think about it, I'm like, I, I'm from the Midwest. 
I don't really want to spend that much time in the Midwest. Right. It, it's hard, right? It's it's not, you know, uh, fluffy, you know, Southern California, like we, where we live. And I think that, um, you know, I was thinking about like, oh, this is what Cranon needs, you know, the amount of work, the amount of effort, like you said, it's going to take years to, you know, convince these sponsors that the value is here. You know, you're going to have to incrementally build social media, television, live stream, and, and you guys have done it. I mean, you know, again, I know you have a whole team and there's a lot of people that deserve credit, um, but, you know, you're also the front guy and the media guy and the connector. So, you know, you know, big mad respect to you and i'm really glad that you know when dots get connected like this you know and the person who's who's leading it you know cares about it because that's one thing i learned from action sports was that when that shift happened where the the people that were from the culture stopped driving the boat the boat crashed in the ocean and it still yeah. is hurt, right right it still hasn't been resurrected to what it was and it's because you know, this culture is about passion, you know, and there's tons of super passionate people that are very intelligent, that are very hardworking, and that's what makes this culture so strong. It does. And, you know, I mean, my life story is a little bit different than yours in the sense that I was never smart enough or, or took the time to build a team in a sense where I had, I mean, th th I've taken on projects that are, should never have been taken on. And, it, and it's nothing but, um, you know, I remember the three or four in the mornings, even at Duraport, to make sure their content was the best it could be. I'm, you know, coming here away from my California home and away from my wife for the summertime. It's because it's what's required. Yeah. It, you know, there isn't another, there's not an agency. There's not, so I've, it's one of the things I did this summer just because my wife's like, I don't really understand what it is you really do. I right. know I know you work hard. So I started sharing emails. Right. Just blindly seeing her. Yeah. And about halfway through the summer, she goes, okay, I don't even know what you're talking about. Whatever this is, right, is way it. too much. Yeah. It's like way too much for one person. And and so, um, but you know, it, by my story, just happens. You know, I'm just the guy who takes the the, the bit by the you know in the teeth and just going to pull this thing if I think it's the right thing to do. Sure. H hell or high water, we're going to make sure it's right. I've yeah. made mistakes. Made Everybody. mistakes here. Yeah. But you know, Cliff always like Marty. If you ain't making mistakes, you ain't trying. Yeah. So I mean, it's but he and the Flannery family have given me the latitude to try to pull this thing to where it is sure. and I've had help have we help I'm not saying that but it sometimes like you it just requires somebody it's not sometimes a democracy no sometimes you have to be a benign dictator and pull totally. this thing because people say well, you can't do this you, this is dumb well I, I think too the other thing that's important to you know recognize is that you're a worldly person right like you've been to Le Mans you've been to Daytona you've seen the world you've seen the world of motorsports you know, you've seen the big races on the West Coast, so you have context for the value of Crandon, right? Like, that's the kind of the irony to me of this whole place is, like, you know, it's it's in the area of the country that shouldn't be happening. Yeah. It, it's being, you know, uh, created and galvanized by people who really shouldn't be spending their time and money on this, right? And, and so it's, like, all the things wrong, but when you get here, you're like, oh, of course this makes sense. It's beautiful, like, why would you think it would be any other way, right? And so for for somebody to come in that has a bigger kind of worldly understanding of, you know, context of sports, motorsports, you know, off-road, and really go, hey, no, listen, this is the value of it, that's really important, you know, and that's what you've done. Yeah, but it's 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 also the challenge you have, like, you know, you can talk about it all day long. Yeah. You have to get them here. Yeah. And once they get here, now this weekend we're blessed with great weather, it looks like, which, <laughs> which, which, which is part of the secret sauce, yeah. even in content, is that when this place, unlike the Lucas Oil Race or anywhere else, this place has grass. Yeah. And it's green, and it looks like a park. And when the sun's <laughs> out, the content looks beautiful. Yeah. And that's part of the secret, too. But you have to get people here to understand. You don't even... 
Susan, my wife, didn't understand until she came. Now she loves coming here. She loves the Midwest. The people are different. It's all different. Well, I think it, it, as it compares to, to Lucas, and, and it was having this conversation about what short course uh, devolved into, right? So let's go back a little bit and into the Mickey Thompson era where short course racing was really a tool that he created to leverage for desert racing, right? And let's also not forget that that Supercross was the halftime show. So it all, was. Yeah. all that came yeah. from that one nucleus, right? And then after he was killed, that kind of fell apart, right? And so Supercross went over here. Short course went by the wayside. But it didn't really go by the wayside. What happened is, you know, a small group of people kept racing in the Midwest. And they took the stadium trucks and they evolved them into what we have now. So that they could be on bigger tracks and outdoors and have more horsepower. I was I was explaining to my guys and they're like, "Where did this come from?" Right. And I'm like, "Well, at one point it w it was all connected, but you know, it, it is remarkable to sit here today with you and to you know to be in you know to be in this barn and to be into in this you know at Crandon, you know the the center of the universe for short course off road racing and one of the pillars of off road culture." And think about how strong and how healthy it is. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, it's it's been a fight and a battle. We've gone through how many series lawsuits have been involved with all of it. Yeah, does you know that's all water on the bridge. But it is interesting to say that. So this all started with this group of people sitting around watching the 1968 Mexican 1000. That's yeah. how this started. They watched Bruce Brown's piece on Wide World of Sports and said, "Well, we got to do that up here." Now they did it different. You know, it was a 25 mile loop through the forest. Right. But it didn't matter. They they figured out they figured out how to get. Uh, to, to give back to the community. They figured out how to have volunteers help. Yeah. They figured all of that out, and, you know, it just evolved. And, and it's, like you said earlier, there's a perfect, like, wrap of this whole thing. You can't sit in a boardroom and plan all this out. It's no, no different than the Mint. It's no different than the King of the Hammers. Yeah. Who would think we'd be sitting, like, somebody was sitting in a boardroom saying, here, we're going to be out in this desert out in Johnson Valley. But what's yeah. going to be awesome, there's nothing there except, Dust. Yeah. What's awesome is we're going to evolve this so that people like Polaris or Ford or anybody else is going to spend 14 days activating there. Yeah. Like, who's going to? How are you going to do that? Nobody never thought that was going to happen. It's, no, it, that's part of the magic of that event, and the Mint has the same. You know, I, I, I yeah, I agree. I appreciate that. And we're going to do the same thing for Parker in the California. <laughs> yeah, 300. exactly. But the you know it's funny because um, Cameron Steele uh, texted me Sunday. And said, um, you know, hey, I, I've got two tickets to Metallica. Do you want them? You and your brother, do you want them? Unfortunately, I was tied up for the evening, so I had to say no. And then one of the one of the guys who works for me, Cameron, went and and you know, he said it was an unbelievable concert. And uh, of course, it is, right? But uh, I always have to use analogies to explain things to people, right? And you know, the analogy that I always used about the creation, you know, mechanism or the creation point is that. You know, if if Metallica sat down and said, oh, you know, we're going to do some music and blah, 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 it wouldn't have been Ride the Lightning. They right. just made it because right. they were like, look, we're going to make some badass music. There's not even an audience yet for this music, but we're going to do it the way we feel that it should be done. And it's not an accountant in a spreadsheet. It's not a boardroom. It's not a 20-story building. It's none of that. It's just pure, you know, tenacity and being punk rock about it and going – Hey, recognize this is cool and fun, and that's what these people did here. Yep, and it created this this institution. And when you look at it, and it's funny, I get I get little I get little laughs out of things that I see that I I can draw the thread back to this. And one of them is, um, uh, you walk around and you look at Nissan trucks, and they say Pro Four on the side of them because of it, it was for here. Absolutely, you know I, I mean? was here for that. Yes, that's and, exactly right. And that's again just the value of this culture and the impact that it's had uh you know in this country and really globally yeah. you know no you're right and, absolutely right and yeah. honestly I, i'm excited for the future because you you have crandon you know we're we're gonna we're gonna have short course racing at the mint you know which will give it a, a west coast uh foothold you know and and hopefully reconnect it back to desert racing which you know it was connected uh, and, you know, continue to go forward and build. And I, I'm, again, like, I'm stoked to be here. Like, I, I would have, I was going to come regardless of whether we were doing anything or not. But it, it also is really fun for me to sit down and talk with you and some of the drivers and the, and the people yeah. here. 
and give give the Midwest some love. Well, you know, you you have to rekindle yourself, right? As a sure. promoter, you have to remind yourself again. Like I went to the Indy 500 this year. Oh yeah, how was that? E- epic. Because now you're looking at it from a promoter standpoint. I met the promoter, you know, the president Doug Bowles. Talk about numbers of people work for him, and you know they they have it. And you, you have, I needed an injection of that to remind myself of what to do here. And it's the same thing for you at the minute. You got to mind yourself what makes sure you can remember, kind of, but you need to see it again and smell it, it and feel it and be 100%. around the people. You got to be. That's 100%. how it works. I'll run an interesting statistic by you because I saw this. Um, do you know what the largest sporting event in the United States was this year? Well, I, it was a single day event was certainly Indianapolis. That, it, that was Indianapolis. Yeah, I was there. And, and it was crazy because I've been there. Now, what they've done, though, is they said, okay, well, what we're going to do is we have 300,000 people. Right. But we have this big infield. So what we're going to do is do a rave party in the infield. Right. And knowing that none of those people are going to watch racing at all. Yeah. They don't care. They're sitting there having a great time. But they've got another 50,000 people there. Sure. So, again, reinventing itself, learning. But, you know, I, I think, like I said, I think what's going to happen to you this weekend I hope, is that you're going to see the, how the hybrid events work here, how, how we have rock race and short course race and class level and music. And, you well, know, th- that's, I, 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 it, it's, it's part of what the future could be. Um, not that necessarily you can replicate Crandon, but certainly there's, there's some, some, 100%. some you know, uh, listen, I think substance that, there for I sure. I think what you're touching on is moving away from creating specialized events solely for racers and race fans and expanding it because... Look, the mission is simple. It's to get people here. That right? is the mission. That is the mission. Because once you get them here, you got them. Right? That's it. It's, yep. I always say, again, dumb analogies. It's like selling drugs. I just got to get you to try it. That's right. You know what I mean? I got you once once you're here. Right? But what's crazy is that the, so the, the, the amazing part is when you finally do move the needle. So here, this yep. year... Last year, we sold out camping in six weeks before the race. Right. Before that, it was six days or it wasn't sold out. This year, no, again, no advertising, no kiss, nothing. We were sold out six months ago. Yeah. So with any, without any other parameter you need to look at, it's like, well, somebody's coming back. Somebody's coming back. They're coming back. Their families are coming back. Their friends are coming. Whatever it is, yeah, th- that's the barometer that you can use. I, I also think that um, COVID did something very interesting to us, right? And it... it it reset our bullshit barometer, right? Completely. What, where people are just like, you know what I want to, this is, you know what? These are the things I want to do. You know, I want to go to Cranon with my family and my friends and have a good time, right? So we're, that's what we're doing. We'll put everything else aside yeah. and we're going to go have a good time. So we saw, you know, at the Mint this year, our numbers were up 30% across the board. And I think, you know, uh, I think part of it is that people, you know, realigned what's valuable to them and said, hey, you know, the end of the world might happen tomorrow, but we're going to live the lives that we want to live, you know, you know, while we're here and, and not be so wrapped up in all this other stuff. Yeah, we saw it here. Yeah. Uh, you know, we saw it here because we, we, we raced in COVID. Yeah. We raced here Labor Day. No advertising because we couldn't. We felt it was wrong to advertise what we were going to do when everybody's running around wearing masks, whatever that meant, felt like. But we had 45,000. Yeah. yeah. Just came because it's Labor Day. It's a yeah. tradition. But but what what struck the most chord, and you'll see it on Sunday again, which you haven't seen before, is we had Kurt Leduc of all people, who's you know truly one of the most you know magnetic personalities you may have uh, around. Just he's Kurt's Kurt. Yeah. But he came up to the, the announce tower and said, "I need to do a toast." Okay. So he he literally got a cup and had everybody on the hill grab a cup. And they started singing Proud to be an American by Lee Gruen. It brings me tears because it was sort of crazy. We're sitting in the sure. infield. Like, what's this sound? And it was the whole hill singing this song. Yeah. The whole hill. Like, yeah. they were, like finally, there was a non-COVID moment. Yeah. Like, we're going to go back to just being people who are Americans who work hard. are going to spend labor day having a good time yeah. without worrying about that stuff. Now, you can call it whatever you want, but, the, but we were legally allowed to, to have the event. Yeah. But... Now, every, every year, we bring, just before the Red Bull Cup race, we bring Pro 2s, introduce them, yeah. line them up with them on the fence. Pro 4s, line them up, introduce all the drivers, and then we have Kurt basically lead the, the hill and singing like a toast to the drivers. It's, it's a great moment, but it came out of COVID. Yeah. And uh, we just some, somehow adapted it. So there's a lot to look forward to this week. I, I, I can't wait. 
on a lot. I still have some things that are lingering where I got to deal with, but it, but it's going to be a great weekend. And I'm super excited that you came and, yeah. and, and kind of reconnected uh, yourself because you, again, you, you're, you're, it's good for you too. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, I'm going to let you get back to it. I know your phone's blowing up right now. That is. Thank you very much for welcome taking the back. time, brother. And well, uh, good luck this weekend. I'm excited. It's going to be a blast. Well, welcome back to the big house, brother. You're always welcome here. <laughs> Thank so, you. you. bet. All right.